the prophet Micah. And we're going to just jump into this interesting little book. Before we do, though, let's stand back. Those of you that may be familiar with our Learn the Bible in 24 Hours summary may recall this slide, which lists the kings of Judah, the southern kingdom. Right after Solomon died, there was a civil war, and they broke into two groups. The southern kingdom, known as Judah, the northern kingdom known as Israel. And I'll try to use the northern kingdom designation so we don't confuse ourselves. Many times in the text, the word Israel really refers to the whole nation. Other times it refers to the house of Israel, that is the northern kingdom. And so we'll try to use the nomenclature, southern and northern kingdom, to avoid confusion. But in any case, in this little slide, you'll notice the book of 1 Kings covers the earlier um, history of both the southern and northern kingdom. Second Kings focuses on uh, the, the, the second parts of that history. I want to move to that because it'll be a little clearer. So we'll take the southern section, that portion that was covered by Second Kings, as our point of reference here. And uh, as we look at this, of course, the northern kingdom goes from bad to worse and ultimately goes into the Assyrian captivity. And it's distinguished in that it doesn't come back from that captivity. It is as a kingdom it, is, uh, it, it uh, leaves the pages of history. And uh, the, the house of Nineveh, the, the city of Nineveh, uh, occurs uh, a subject earlier before the, that captivity. So it's represented such on the slide. The southern kingdom ultimately goes into the Babylonian captivity and is distinguished in that it is promised restoration from that. After 70 years, it returns to history, and we'll be looking at that. And... Uh, what many people fail to realize is that Babylon, as it rises to power, it rises to include the Assyrian Empire. So those captives that were in the northern kingdom that were distributed throughout that kingdom are absorbed then in the Babylonian regime, if you will. Many people overlook the implications of that. We'll talk a little bit about that as we go. But you need to understand that the captives of the, uh, uh, that the northern kingdom falls through idolatry earlier to the Assyrians. One of the cities within that empire, Babylon, rises to power to take over the whole empire, leads to what we call the Babylonian Empire. And such falls heir to all the captives, not just the ones that they take from the southern kingdom, but the ones that were previously, virtually a century earlier, uh, taken by the Assyrians. Following the Babylonian captivity, God promises them, frankly, because of his commitments to David, that they would return, and they did. And that is what we sometimes call the post-exile period, using the exile to Babylon as sort of a milestone. And uh, it's in that era that we have the books of Ezra, Nehemiah, and Esther, under the leadership of Zerubbabel and so on. Okay, that's a quick perspective. What we want to do with that, then, is take a look at the major prophets. Isaiah, of course, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and Daniel have very large books, so they're known as the major prophets. They wrote it very, very extensively. And uh, Isaiah and the t uh, gives you a rough feeling there in the, in the southern kingdom where he presides, or he, uh, his, his uh, preaching is relevant. He is followed by Jeremiah, which c continues his ministry right on to the time of the Babylonian captivity. Ezekiel and Daniel both are, are uh, uh, active in the, during the period of the Babylonian captivity. Daniel gets deported first to Babylon, and Ezekiel in the second of three deportations. And so, okay, what I, this is all background. There you see the Isaiah, Jeremiah, Daniel, Ezekiel portrayed. But it's these minor prophets that you find in your Bible in, rather, in a rather strange order. Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah, Nahum, Habakkuk, uh, Zephaniah, Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi. And I hope our Jewish friends will excuse our mispronunciation of all of those. I'll rely on the way you've probably heard it. A good Jewish friend will correct you on the proper pronunciation. I won't try to mimic that here and show my, my uh, uh, ineptitude by trying. But let's take a look at where they fit in logically. Now Hosea preached to the northern kingdom roughly in the time of Jeroboam the second. And uh, now uh, Joel speaks to the southern kingdom in the time of Amaziah. Okay. Amos is the another prophet that speaks to the northern kingdom. 
and, uh, and just roughly contemporaneous with Hosea. Obadiah is near the end of the southern kingdom before the exile. So he, he is in a, a, a totally different place. Jonah speaks, in effect, to Nineveh, very upset that he was called to go to the enemy of Israel. Uh, and as you know the story, and, uh, he, was, he wanted to run off until God explained to him a little more clearly, and he ends up carrying the message to Nineveh, and as a result of his message, Nineveh repents, and they survive another century. But sooner or later, uh, well, we'll come to that, Micah, meanwhile, is roughly contemporaneous with Isaiah to the southern kingdom. Okay. Nahum is back against Nineveh, and this time they don't listen, and that's when they actually fall. So Jonah and Nineveh sort of bracket from the repentance under Jonah to the fall uh, from, as a result of their failure to repent under Nahum. And that's when the Assyrian falls to one of their cities, Babylon, which grows so powerfully as to take over the whole package the Babylonian Empire. Well, okay, Habakkuk uh, is uh, uh, to the southern kingdom just prior to the exile, and uh, Zephaniah is also in the southern kingdom in, in the days of Manasseh and following, and uh, these are all just ahead of the exile. Now, after they, after they go to Babylon captivity, and we have Daniel and Ezekiel, we then encounter um, the uh, post-exile prophets, Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi. All three of them are preaching after the return of, from Babylon. Now, what, the reason I'm going through this is the order of these are sort of strange. There's no relationship in their order in the Bible, either chronologically or to their, who their primary audience is. So for our purposes, as we, as we attack the minor prophets, it may be more useful for us and, and I, oh, by the way, I should mention, just to finish my diagram here historically, after the exile, we have what are called the 400 silent years, the years between the Old Testament and the New Testament. And you'll find books written about the so-called silent years, the years after Malachi, prior to the New Testament. They're called the 400 silent years, but that's misleading because they are in your Bible. And they're predicted in advance in Daniel chapter 11, verses 5 through 35, chronicle what happened in those 400 years so precisely that the cynics and the skeptics say, well, it must have really been written later. But Jesus refutes that by ascribing it to Daniel, the prophet, and we won't go there for now. But let's talk about these 12 minor prophets that we're going to try to attack and understand. Let's put them in a little different order. We have the northern kingdom is focused on by, well, Elisha, of course, but he didn't leave any writings. We have Hosea and Amos up there. Good. Nineveh will set aside as a separate subject with Jonah and Nahum. Fair enough. So that covers the northern kingdom and its primary protagonist. The southern kingdom is focused on, among the minor prophets, Joel, Micah, Zephaniah, Habakkuk, and Obadiah. And then we get to the post-exile three, Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi. That is a clustering that may be more useful to you. Put it up here so you can copy it down for your notes if you like. A clustering that's perhaps a little more meaningful. If you associate Hosea and Amos as prophets that address the, nor the northern kingdom, fair enough. Jonah and Nahum focusing on Nineveh and all of that. The southern kingdom, Joel, Micah, Zephaniah, Habakkuk, and Obadiah, primarily dealing with the southern kingdom prior to the exile. And then the last three, Haggai, Zechariah, Malachi, are after the exile to Babylon. And that, that groups them in a way that may be more meaningful uh, in terms of your understanding them and the times in which they live. Now, by the way, we're into Micah, and there are many Micahs in the Bible. There was a man uh, of Mount Ephraim, whose history is introduced in Judges 17, apparently for the purpose of leading uh, to an account of the settlement of the tribe of Dan in the northern Palestine, and to illustrate the lawlessness of the times in which he lived. And that's in Judges 18, 19, and to the end. And so there's also the son of Merabal, or Mephibosheth, in 1 Chronicles 8. There's also a Micah that's the first in the rank of the priests of the family of the Kohathites. These are just either other Micahs. There's one that's a descendant of Joel the Reubenite, and there's the Morashite that's so called to distinguish him from Micaiah, the son of Imla, in the reign of Ahab. That's another whole uh, First Kings issue. But Micah was a prophet, the one we're interested in, of Judah. He was a younger contemporary of Isaiah, and he was a native of a place called Morasheth of Gath. 
That's a place about 20 miles southwest of Jerusalem near Lachish. And uh, he prophesied in the latter half of the 8th century B.C. And uh, there is no accident, there is no such thing as an accidental name. His name is relevant. The names of all of them are really relevant. Micah, which is a shortened form of Micaiah, which is who is like Yah or Yehovah, if you will. That's what the name really means. Who is like him? I'll contrast that with Michael. We all know Michael the archangel. Michael means who is like El, the, another name for God. So Michael and Micah are very similar. They use a different name for God, different one, uh, uh, names for God, but the concept is very parallel, if you will. Let's talk a little bit about the tenure. Micah prophesied during the reigns of Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah over the southern kingdom, or Pekahiah, Pekah, and Hosea over at the northern kingdom. Now, it's interesting that he never uses the names of the kings, calling them kings in the north. See, he almost takes a, a subtle way of disallow, di disavowing them as kings, if you will, because they were the rebels in a sense. But in any case, uh, so there are three kings of the southern kingdom that Micah is contemporaneous with and three kings in the northern kingdom that contemporaneous with. The whole period that Micah seems to cover is approximately the period of about 40 years. And he's concerned over the failures of the northern kingdom. Many commentators mistake, say that he's addressing the northern kingdom. Not really. He addresses the northern kingdom critically, primarily because of the lessons that are there for the southern kingdom. The southern kingdom should be learning by the misbehavior of the north and how God dealt with that. And so that's what Micah is dealing with that, but he's dealing with it in the sense of a lesson to the south, if you will. And uh, so he's, he's, he's concerned with the implications of the north for the south in that sense. So what makes Micah different than some of his, uh, these other prophets? If you study Hosea, Joel, and Amos, and Obadiah, you'll quickly discover that their messages were unheeded. Their warnings were rejected. And as a result, judgment came. Micah will be different. It's interesting that the nearer God's judgment were at hand, the more obstinately the false prophets denied that they would come. I think that's very, very interesting for us to apply to ourselves today. The more, the closer the judgments are, the more the false prophets will deny them. That sounds like it should be obvious, but it should be obvious in the inverse sense. We should recognize that false prophets will poo-poo, discourage, depress, the dis discount that, prophet, that the fulfillment of prophecies are near. The nearer they are, the more they'll be discounted by the false teachers. See, false prophecy in those days was a gainful occupation. Why? Because they had a marketing advantage. The false prophets had man's wishes on their side. Whoops! Does that sound familiar? You know, it's interesting as I read, go through all my old notes on Micah and as I try to bring it up to date and freshen it up a little bit for this series, I'm really startled to, to realize more than ever how contemporary, contemporaneously they apply to us today. And uh, Micah is really quite a prophet. It's very unfortunate that he falls in the category of a minor prophet because you're going to discover for a number of reasons that Micah's seven chapters include some of the most profound passages in the entire Bible. So it should be a fun time. Now, as I say, Hosea and Amos were ignored. Jeremiah was imprisoned. In Micah's cases, his message was heeded. Boy, that's different. Repentance followed. And disaster was postponed for a century, thanks to him. So that's, that makes him different. Here's a prophet like Jonah that actually changed history. Jonah went to Nineveh and changed the the Gentile history for a hundred years because they repented. One man can make a difference. That's the message of Jonah and that's the message of Micah we're going to discover. One man can make a difference. Are you such a person is the question that needs to lurk in your mind as you think about this, as you go through the studies. Are you one of those people that can be changing history? Let's take a look at the historical session here. Micah is a uh, contemporary of Isaiah. Hosea and Amos, probably a friend of Isaiah, incidentally, and his book has been called a miniature book of Isaiah by a number of the commentators. There are many striking similarities between the two. In fact, Isaiah 
prefixes his second chapter with three verses from Micah's prophecy. Now, who's quoting who? Big argument. A lot of scholars wonder who's calling who. But clearly, the first three, there are three verses that are very, very similar. Now, it's interesting that Micah prophesied during the reigns of Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah. And it bore fruit in the reign of Hezekiah. Well, 2 Kings 18 through 20 deals with that. It's also worth noting that no kings of the northern kingdom are mentioned by the prophet. Only the prophets of Israel make mention of the kings of Israel. In other words, the, southern, the prophets that are from the south don't ascribe those kings as kings. It's sort of a backhanded. There, there are a number of people that uh, we have an occupant in the White House today that many people don't refer to him by his official title because they don't really buy it for their own personal reasons, whatever. But uh, the capital of the northern kingdom was a place called Samaria. The city was built originally by Omri, the king of Israel, and was the seat of idolatry. Key point. It was the seat of idolatry. That's why God destroyed them. It was made infamous by Ahab and his, his uh, queen Jezebel, who was an idolatrous uh, 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 queen. And they built a temple to Baal. And uh, God sent Elisha, Elijah first, and then Elisha. Elijah is from the first kings, Elisha in the second king's time and Amos, to turn them from their practices. But they didn't. Hosea, who is Micah's contemporary pretty much, also prophesied against the northern kingdom. His warnings went unheeded. Hosea came from the south. He was from the south. But God commissioned him to take his message to the north. Many people get confused by that. And the whole point that, that God told them in the north through Hosea is that God used their enemies as his instrument of judgment. To the extent there is a parallel between the predicament of the northern kingdom and the United States, there's some disturbing parallels to follow through on. Because if, if the parallel exists, and we think it does, that's why he did a briefing pack called Hosea Can You See, which is a, a study of the parallelism between Hosea's book from chapter 4 through 14 and the apparent profile of America today, the parallel is astonishing. If it is valid, then maybe God again is going to use our enemies as his instrument of judgment. That doesn't sound logical to us. It didn't sound logical to Habakkuk either. But that's part of the dynamic that the scripture seems to lay out. We need to take heed to. Now when you see Hosea, can you see it's our breathing back that shows these parallels as far as Hosea is concerned. Now, Getting back a little perspective here, about 734 B.C., the Assyrians carried away all of North Israel. In 721, in other words, a few decades later, Shamanese of Assyria attacked the northern capital of Samaria and overthrew it and deported the remaining people of the northern kingdom, uh, so-called House of Israel, by to some, and that was 721. But it actually started a couple of decades before, but it was finally 721 that the capital itself finally falls, Samaria does, and that's the end of the northern kingdom in history. And Tiglath Pileser, the primary leader there, had a very interesting policy. He took his captives and deported them and intermixed them from other people. So the, his concept was that would avoid any nationalism that could lead in rebellion. And that was his policy. And that means that the identity of the northern kingdom was gone. The individuals were there, but they were not restricted to just the northern tribes. Because it, it, we'll talk about that here in a minute. The, eight years later, Sennacherib, Shalmaneser's successor, attacked the southern kingdom. What's calling themselves of Judah. But uh, an angel prevented that from going for, for it. By the way, the word Sennacherib, it means sin multiplies its father. The word sin in Assyrian was the name for the moon god. We use the word sin in an English sense of meaning sin and missing the mark or something. Uh, it's, a, it's a different word altogether. Anyway. It's interesting, in the Assyrian tangle with the south, southern kingdom, at one point the field commander appeared before the walls and challenged them to surrender. And Sennacherib sent a letter to, the, to the Hezekiah to the same effect. Hezekiah took his letter and went before the Lord and laid it out. And he received confirmation through Isaiah, the prophet Isaiah, that the city would be spared and Sennacherib would fail. That's when one angel one night after dinner slaughters 185,000 Assyrians and they never again attacked the south. That cured him of that. 
Hezekiah organized a revival, smashed the idols of his predecessor. Even the, the original brazen serpent that we read about in Numbers 21 was still around and being worshipped, sort of like some people worship the Shroud of Turin or something. It was a relic that became more important than it should have been. And so after a thousand years, it had become a fetish, and uh, they were burning incense to it. And so Hezekiah destroys it, calls it Nehushtan, a thing of brass. But I want to mention something kind of interesting. There's a hidden hero in all of this. Under Hezekiah, bear in mind, under Hezekiah, the primary prophet was Isaiah. He was the royal guy. His, his vocabulary was, probably exceeds all the others in the uh, Old Testament. He, he was a tremendous prophet, wrote a lot of stuff, terrific prophet. But it's interesting, he's not the, the, uh, the account of why there was a, a uh, revival under Hezekiah. Micah is not even mentioned. Isaiah is the well-known prophet of that period with direct access to the king. But we know from an incident a century later that it was actually because of Micah's preaching that the people repented and Jerusalem was spared. How do I come to that conclusion? Because Jeremiah, 120 years later, was prophesying over the impending destruction of Jerusalem. This is Jeremiah 26. His message so offended the priests and the false prophets that they seized him, brought him poor officials, and demanded his death. They put, him in, they put him in jail. Jeremiah gave his defense, and what was his defense? He cited the previous experience of Micah. And here's what he says in Jeremiah 26, verse 18. Jeremiah testifying on his own behalf here. He says, Micah the Morshite had prophesied in the days of the Hezekiah the king of Judah and spake to all the people of Judah saying, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, Zion shall be plowed like a field and Jerusalem shall become heaps and the mountain of the house as the high places of a forest. Did Hezekiah king of Judah and all Judah put him at all to death? Did he not fear the Lord and besought the Lord and the Lord repented of him of the evil which he had pronounced against them? Thus might we procure great evil against our souls. In other words, Jeremiah in his defense is making reference to the fact that Micah was the guy that really caused the repentance under Hezekiah a century earlier. Anyway, as a result, Jeremiah was spared. 120 years later, Micah's words were remembered and used by God to spare Jeremiah. A little tidbit you don't pick up. and you sort of, The more you think about it, it's strange because Isaiah was the big guy, the guy with access to the king, and he was the major prophet. It was Micah's preaching that is, uh, that, my, that Jeremiah could point to as the cause of the revival. In fact, it appears that Micah lived to see the beginning of Hezekiah's revival himself. So who was he really? We don't know much about his life. He was a rural prophet like Amos, not of the city or the palace, like his contemporary Isaiah. He's this cunning country boy. His writing is pungent and personal. He is touching and tender. Many of the passages will prove familiar to most Christians because Micah was the authority referred to by Herod's advisor during the famed visit of the Magi. We read about that every Christmas. But it's Micah's verse that emerges in that story, and it will be a major topic when we get to chapter 2 of Micah. Jesus quotes from Micah several times. One of them is Matthew 10. Let's, let's touch a couple of key verses that you probably have already memorized. But uh, in Micah 6, 8 is one of the key verses to many people. He hath showed thee, O man, what is good, and what doth the Lord require of thee, but to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly before thy God. Some people call this the Old Testament Sermon on the Mount, sort of a guide for the personal walk. It's easy. Some people may make too much of it, but it is quite a common verse with a lot to say. And uh, Micah pronounced judgment on the cities of Israel and on Jerusalem, the urban centers of the nation. He's, an ur you know, he's a country boy taking a message to the city. And he can be labeled the prophet of the city, condemning its violence, corruption, robbery, covetous, gross materialism, spiritual bankruptcy, and illicit. Sounds like he's a prophet for today, isn't it? You can mention a number of cities that would line up with that very nicely. Violence, corruption, robbery, covetous, gross materialism, spiritual bankruptcy, and illicit sex, and so forth. And uh, yet, through the gloom of impending judgment, Micah clearly saw the coming glory of the redemption of Israel, which makes this book so relevant to our time. It's relevant not only because of the darkness, the spiritual darkness that confronts us. I have conversations almost every day with one of our board members or someone else where we contrast the darkness that we're being plunged into in our country in terms of all these things, in terms of corruption, 
Not just among our politicians, in our court, you go every place you look, and, uh, and so forth. It's interesting that the gloom is certainly there on our horizon, spiritually. On the other hand, what makes this book so relevant, this book not only deals with that, it gives us a glimpse of the kingdom that's coming right behind that. And so it's going to be a very, very relevant book, not just because of its preachments of our need for repentance. On the one hand, it's also going to give us a kingdom perspective that we also need to make the center of our priorities. So, so the, his grand question is, who is like unto thee, God? You, thee, speaking to God. I'm always reminded of Socrates' famous insight, which I think is remarkable for a, for a Gentile philosopher. He says, perhaps deity can forgive sins, but I don't see how. Socrates had enough insight to realize that forgiving sins by God would compromise his holiness. He couldn't, he couldn't reconcile that. That's tremendous insight that we need to understand. And that's exactly what Micah deals with by the time he gets to chapter 7. He says, Who is a God like unto thee that pardoneth iniquity and passes by the transgression of the remnant of his heritage? He retaineth not his anger forever because he delighteth in mercy. That's the God we worship. It's a merciful God. But he's far more than that. He's an abundant God has contrived a way to forgive us our sins without compromising his righteousness. And that's something else that Micah will deal with as we go here. God hates sin, but he loves sinners. We always get that backwards. We always get that backwards. God hates sin, but he loves a sinner. And he wants to save them. And that them is us, right? Okay. But His holiness requires Him to deal with any rebellion, and that's what He's also going to deal. That's what I mean. That's why judgment is coming. He wants to save sinners, and He will save them if they come to Him in faith. Okay, so chapter 1 will deal with sins against God. Chapter 2 will deal with sins against each other. Chapter 3 will deal with sins by our leaders. So there's a build-up there. Okay? So this chapter is going to focus on our sins against God. So Micah chapter 1, we'll jump right in. Verse 1, The word of the Lord that came to Micah the Morasite in the days of Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah, which he saw concerning Samaria and Jerusalem. When you see Samaria, realize that's the capital of the northern kingdom. Jerusalem is the capital of the southern kingdom. So they're idiomatically including the whole group, not just the city. Morashite, of course, is a small country village about 20 miles southwest of Jerusalem. And archaeologists have to uh, identify with the ruins of Tel El Judeath Day, which is, it, which is near Gath, which was on the Philistine border. Samaria and Jerusalem, of course, uh, that, uh, uh, Micah prophesied from the southern kingdom, but his prophecy concerns the northern kingdom during the time it was under attack by Assyria. So we're going to hear a lot about that, but recognize that his real motive is to make a contrast for our learning here. And, of course, the uh, northern kingdom would ultimately be carried away by the Assyrians. Second verse, hear all ye people, hearken, O earth, and all that therein is. Let the Lord God be a witness against you for the Lord from his holy temple. Three times Micah will use this term, hear, hear ye, whatever. And there are three primary prophetic strains. Here in chapter 1, another one will be in chapter 3, another one will start in chapter 6 and carry right into chapter 7. They're just uh, uh, in a symphony. It's sort of like a a strain, a, 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 a theme. O earth and all that therein is. Notice that's a phrase that includes us too. The all that there herein is, that means us Jewish or not, if you will. So we, you and I, need to pay attention is the, the embedded thought here. For behold, the Lord cometh forth out of his place and will come down and tread upon the high places of the earth. The high places, that's a term that is a biblical term for locations of idol worship. The idolaters always built their, their, their temples or whatever on the high point. So the high places was, becomes idiomatic of false worship, the idolaters. And uh, you saw that there's a number of places, all through the scriptures you'll find that allusion. And the mountain shall be molten under him. And the valley shall be cleft as wax before the fire and as the waters that are poured down a steep place. Now this, you'll find this extreme language 
all through the scriptures, from the book of Judges onward, all the way to Habakkuk. And uh, many people assume it's just poetic language. There are many, including the writings of uh, uh, some of the catastrophists, that believe that those were eyewitness accounts of some of the prior judgments on the earth. And that gets into a whole other topic that we deal with in depth when you get to Joshua chapter 10 and the, the near passbys of Mars and all that sort of thing. We won't get, to get derailed here on that. But it is sobering to reflect on the fall of the great cities of the past that were once the lifeblood of ancient empires and are now in ruins. You know, it's interesting to, as you see some of the historical uh, movies made about Rome, you can easily, as you get confronted with the grandeur of Rome at that day, how they believed it was eternal, it was forever, it'd never fall. And we smile at that today because of ruin, Rome, of course, is the, their empire is a ruins. It's interesting, you go through all the great cities of the past and realize how powerful they were and how they were the lifeblood of everything going on in those days. And they're gone. They're gone. And uh, we need to keep that. It's interesting how we take for granted the status quo. Ephesus, Pergamos, and Rome. These were all ancient, ancient uh, centroids of all world commerce at one time. What about Washington, D.C.? New York? Are they also in their sunset years? Twilight years, if you will. Well, let's go on. For the transgression of Jacob is all this, and for the sins of the house of Israel. He's focusing on their immediate. What is the transgression of Jacob? Is it not Samaria? What are the high places of Judah? Are they not Jerusalem? Again, see Samaria and Jerusalem being the capital, characteristic capitals, if you will, of both the north and south. And they're here in view. And uh, they both had become corrupt. Now, Micah is focusing on the corruption of the north because it's going to be destroyed, and his argument implicitly is the south should be taking lessons from that. By watching the frailty of the north, they should realize they too are frail and overdue for judgment. They both had become corrupt. They both had abandoned their heritage after 200 years. I think that's rather interesting. All the great studies of world civilizations, and there's been a half a dozen of them by great historical scholars over the years, they all come to the same conclusion that the rough lifetime of these empires was about two centuries. And how interesting, in, how interesting it is, is that our heritage is also being abandoned after about two centuries. That's what caused these other ones to crumble, and maybe us too. Are there other capitals that have become corrupt? Are there other capitals that have abandoned their heritage after two centuries? I can think of one, and we're in it. It's time for some serious reflection on that as we watch the, her the geopolitical horizon and recognize that our corruption is from inside. The high places of Judah. Again, that, the mountains and hills, were that's where the pagan altars were erected. Those idioms are... It's uh, idiomatic of, of uh, idolatry. And uh, now, the reformation of the godly king Hezekiah in the fifth year of his reign had not taken place yet. That's forthcoming at the time this is being written. Okay. See, bear in mind, Micah does succeed in getting some result from his preaching here. Therefore, I will make Samaria as a heap of the field and as planting as the vineyard, and I will pour down the stones thereof into the valley, and I will discover or uncovers, where we would say it, the foundations thereof. See, Micah is focusing on the Assyrian invasion of 2 Kings 17 and following. His primary target will end up being the southern kingdom, but he first highlights the plight of the northern kingdom as, in effect as an object lesson. This is the same approach that Amos used to the, uh, open his opening chapters, pronounced judgments on a number of nations. When you study the book of Amos, he, he spoke against Syria, against Philistia, against Tyre, against Edom, Ammon, Moab, and then finally Judah the south, and then, then he finally focuses on his own people, namely Israel. He does that same trick. He talks about everybody else, but then gets at the real point, and that's the plight of his own people. And the fall of the capital of the northern kingdom actually occurred in the memory of Micah's listeners. So Micah is giving them a history lesson that they should be learning from. The local, this local disturbance that we're seeing in verses 6 through 16 of Micah corresponds with 2 Kings 17, eight, first 18 verses. That gives rise to a prophecy of greater invasion in the last days. When you get to Micah chapter 4, he's going to predict the big one that's coming. 
and that in turn will be uh, uh, idiomatic of the Lord's deliverance at Armageddon. Now this gives us an opportunity to be acquainted with a phenomenon we observe within the prophetic literature, many times, not just once. The prophet tends to see two events. He, sent, he sees an early event, and then it echoes in, a, in advance a later event. And there is a time gap between them. People have different labels for this. Some people call it the double reference or the double fulfillment. There are, different, there are a number of labels, and some of those labels can be a little tricky. But the point is, clearly, there's a, very many times an early event that is clear, and it tends to be confirming. In Deuteronomy 18, we have a test of a prophet. A prophet predicts something. If it comes true, he speaks to the Lord. If it doesn't come true, they stoned him. And, if, and so, if we applied those techniques, there'd be a lot of rock piles around. But the point is, the idea was, though, that a prophet would mention two things. If the first thing, the early thing, came true, you, you could rely on what he said that tends to corroborate the big one that's coming. The logic is there, but it's not, it's not clear unless you have that laid out for yourself. We call this first event sometimes a type. It can be an object, it can be an anecdote, it can be a parable, it can be any number of things. But its point, it, supposed, it alludes to what's called an antitype. An ty- antitype is simply something that is anticipated by a type. Those terms are terms from rhetoric or communication, but uh, 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 we speak a lot, you'll hear a lot, the term type is used biblically lots of times. You don't hear the word antitype, but that's simply what the type is pointing to. In many of these things, the type is a type of the Messiah, or it's a type of the Antichrist, and so forth, and uh, so on. Continuing with Micah, verse 6, Therefore I will make Samaria as a heap of the field, as plantings of a vineyard, and I will pour down the stones thereof into the valley, and I will uncover the foundations thereof. The word vineyard there was probably uh, a vineyard originally, Today, though, it lies in ruins, as Micah so aptly describes. What the Assyrians began was fulfilled by John Hyrcanus under the Maccabeans. And, then, and uh, the, 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 the utter destruction, if you will, the final destruction of Samaria in the sense of the northern kingdom. And uh, continue, all the graven images thereof shall be beaten into pieces, and all the hires thereof shall be burned with the fire, and all the idols thereof will I lay desolate, for she gathered it, of the hire of an harlot, and they shall return to the hire of an harlot. See, Amos too, just Amos, just like Micah, Amos denounced the northern kingdom for their sexual immorality, their cultic prostitution, and all of that. And all the way through uh, the scriptures, we could track all that down, but I think it's pretty familiar to most of you. Now, it's interesting, we talk a lot about our so-called new morality. That's little, nothing more than a return to these pagan practices of antiquity. It's, it's really a shock uh, to see the parallels of our culture today and these ancient cultures. See, for, for another example of what religion has done, examine India, the impoverished and bound by, bound by the fetters of religion. It's a shock to realize how that culture has been held back by the, 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 the forces of, of a form of idolatry. And recognize that Christianity is not a religion. It's a person. John 8 and so forth uh, goes, deals with that. And that's why this is a call to repentance, a repentance, a call for repentance that we need to heed, heed to. Let's move on here. Therefore, I will wail and howl. I will go stripped and naked. I will make a wailing like dragons and mourning like as the owls. Well, stripped and naked. He's not asking them to do anything that he isn't doing himself. Going naked really was probably just going barefoot. It was a sign of mourning to go barefoot. That's stripped and naked. That's a way of indicating your commitment. And uh, dragons and mornings of owls is a translational problem. More like wailings of jackals and ostriches. There are different ex- uh, uh, exegetical experts that uh, uh, identify these things slightly differently. Not critical. It's a figure of speech in any case. For her wound is incurable. For it has come unto Judah. He has come into the gate of my people, even at Jerusalem. The word is anash. It means incurable. In Jeremiah 17, 9, our sins, our heart is incurably wicked. It's not desperately wicked. That's the way it's sometimes translated. The word anash actually means incurably. Nowhere in the Bible does someone heal the heart. 
He replaces it with a new one. And that's why we call it a new birth and so on and so forth. And so, this whole, all this stuff had an early origin. It was actually Enosh's, Seth's son, that was the first to indulge in idolatry. Many people don't realize this because of mistranslation in Genesis 4, 25, 26. It's often mistranslated. In the Targum Onkelos, it was Enosh that desisted from praying in the name. It says he called upon the name. That's a misunderstanding from that early start. Targum of Jonathan, he surnamed the idols in the name of God. Kimshi, Rashi, and the other ancient Jewish commentators all agree on this. It just is a, an erroneous translation that continues within our English Bible. Jerome indicated this was the opinion of many Jews of his day. Maimonides, my comedy on the Mishnah, which is part of the Talmud, by the way. And I'm not here to extol the Talmud. That's another whole problem, but let's go on here. Ascribes the origin of idolatry to the days of Enosh. So these had early, early beginnings. So the evils of the north have infected the south, is the point. That was the flavor of what Mike is pointing out. It started in the north. They've been condemned. But it's like an infection or virus. It's taken hold in the south. The south had an entire century to learn from the judgment that fell on the north. That's the long and the short of Micah's message. He's talking about the North, but as an object lesson that we should be watching from. You and I should be paying attention to the South, because it also got judged, if you will. And that's what Isaiah 10 is all about, Isaiah 36 is all about, and that's what Micah is all about. Now the rest of the book of Micah is going to focus more specifically on Judah and Jerusalem. All this talk about the North was really as an object lesson for the South. Now we need to recognize, just as Micah's audience need to recognize the North wasn't the other people, there are people we should be learning from, we too should realize that the Bible doesn't always talk about other people. The most important target of these words of God are us. We too should study and understand and regard the judgments of the past. We need to understand them. One of the reasons that Micah's ministry reaped results was his specificity. He applies six of the 16 verses of this chapter to list the very cities that will participate in the coming disaster, including his own hometown. Now, his specificity, he lists these towns, but you miss the point of this unless you understand the Hebrew because they're puns. They are literal towns that are going to be judged, but there's also some wordplay overlaying this that we'll go through. The cities that are listed from verse 10 through 15 were in West Judah. That's Micah's home territory. And they were devastated by the Assyrians along with the overthrow of the northern kingdom. That's still before Jerusalem falls. Understand that. So Micah's flow is going to be from Samaria, which fell, to Jerusalem ultimately. Now Ezekiel 38 and 39 will have a similar role for the current nation of Israel. So those of you who study that can begin to draw those parallels. But if you do that, keep an eye, of course, on Psalm 83, which may be the embracing of the famous issue of Isaiah 17. That's just a footnote for you buffs that want to get into that. Let you and I move on. Micah then, in verse 10, says something interesting. He says, Declare ye it not at Gath. Weep ye not at all in the house of Ephra. Roll thyself. In the... the word Gath there means wine press. It, that word means Weep town. The word means, it's like a wine press, it weeps, the oil. See, weep not at weep town is what really is implied here in the Hebrew. Micah sets the tone for this section by an introductory quotation from David's elegy over Saul and Jonathan. When, when David, after Saul and Jonathan were killed, David has an elegy over them that we'll look at here in a minute uh, after the Israelite defeat at Mount Gilboa. We got Mount Gilboa is when Saul and Jonathan get killed. David has a famous elegy that echoes in the ears of every, every Jewish uh, uh, student of the, the Old Testament. He, he, David says, The beauty of Israel is slain upon the high places. How, the mighty, how are the mighty fallen? Tell it not in Gath. Publish it not in the streets of Ascalon. Lest the daughters of the Philistines rejoice. And lest the daughters of the uncircumcised triumph. That's P, uh, uh, David eulogizing. So, but that phrase, tell it not in Gath, is what Micah is picking up here in this. Tell, declare it not in Gath, weep ye not at all in the house, and so forth. Now the house of Aphra, the word Beth Aphra is the house belonging to Aphra, the house of dust, if you will. In other words, the citizens will cover themselves with dust as a traditional rite of mourning. And uh, 
it's, I think that uh, one, of the, one of the commentators, Leslie Allen, uh, says that names are treated like omens, which once observed haunt the localities until they are fulfilled. They are revealed as clues to the curse that is to come upon the country. Micah's intense dismay in the sinister uh, destinies of these cities is reflected in their names. These puns were viewed as omens. Puns are, what are the, here are used like homonyms. Two words that sound alike but mean something different. And they're deliberately what we call a deliberate connotative transfer, which can be used to imply editorial comment. And uh, we have a list of 200 examples of these rhetoric, rhetorical devices in our appendix to our book on cosmic codes. Anyway, moving on, verse 11. Pass ye away, thou inhabitant of Saphir, having thy name naked. The inhabitant of Zanan came not forth in the morning of Beth Ezel. He shall receive of you his, uh, his standing. Saphir. Sounds like the word for beautiful, yet not for long. The cities will be marched away naked and enshamed. There's a contrast between beautiful and what the way they're really going to be treated. So there's a deliberate antithetical uh, device here. Zaman sounds like the Hebrew word for exit, march, or go out. And uh, again, in contrast, they will be shut up inside their city like animals until it falls. So here's a case where the word is using uh, uh, to mean the opposite, antithetically. Pass ye away, thou inhabitant of Severe, having thy name shaken, and so forth. Um, Beth Ezel means the nearby city, but it will be not near in that day, because it's going, be, it's going to be taken up with its own mourning, that it will be of no help to the others. For the inhabitant of Meroth waited carefully for good, but the evil came down from the Lord unto the gate of Jerusalem. Now, Meroth, the word means bitterness. Mara, remember, in the Naomi, and so forth, means bitterness. That Marth will writhe in bitterness, is the thought. O thou inhabitant of Lachish, bind the chariot to the swift beasts. She is the beginning of the sin to the daughter of Zion, for the transgressions of Israel were found in thee. Lachish was a well known military city about 30 miles southwest of Jerusalem, famous for chariot horses. They're being harnessed to flee, not to fight, is the thought. Looking. It's, a, it's very difficult to pick up the flavor of the Hebrew and translate it into English and without a flavor of what it really meant to his listeners. This town was first, uh, first introduced to idolatry in Judah, as Jeroboam the son of Nebat had, had done in Israel. It was the link of idolatry between Israel and Judah, or between the north and south. Like, like it was the first entry of idolatry into the south. And uh, the, this important city was taken years later at the time of Sennacherib's invasion. He considered its conquest significant enough to have scenes of its encirclement and fall, decorate its great palace at Nineveh, and that's now, you can see those reliefs when you visit the London Museum, the British Museum in London. Those reliefs are, that were from Nineveh are Sennacherib celebrating his encirclement and fall of this, this city. Therefore shalt thou give presents to Morasheth Gath, the house of Achzib shall be a lie to the kings of Israel. That's his hometown. And it sounds like the word betrothed in the Hebrew. So he speaks of giving the city wedding gifts as she passes from the rule of her own family to the authority of her cruel new husband, the invader. So she's being, it's, it's, he's, he's being uh, cynical or sarcastic here in a sense. Aksib sounds like aksab, which means deceitful or disappointing. It's going to lie, be a lie to the kings of Israel. Micah says she'll prove deceptive to the kings of Israel. Aksabim are the brooks that are dry in the summer, deceiving the thirsty traveler, is the flavor of the thought here. And Jeremiah does a similar thing in chapter 15. Yet will I bring an heir to thee, O inhabitant of Marshath. He shall come unto Adullam, the glory of Israel. Marshath is related to the word Yoresh, or possessor, or heir, and she'll be possessed by someone else, is the idea. See, each one of these has a thought that's almost being used antithetically, in a judgmental sense. Yet will I bring an heir to thee, he says, uh, and he shall come unto Adullam. That was the place of refuge to which David had gone during the dismal days when he was in flight from King Saul. So it's a, it's a place of flight, a refuge, if you will. So it's going to happen again, Micah says. For the aristocracy of Israel will be forced to take refuge in that area. They'll be fleeing, is this point. Make thee bald, and pole thee for thy delicate children. Enlarge thy baldness as the eagle, for they are gone into captivity from thee. Now we need to understand as we go here, we're capturing just the light flavor of the translation from the Hebrew, doing the best we can to put it in the same coloration. 
Uphold thee for thy delicate children. This chapter is going to close here with an appeal to Jerusalem as the parent of her children. All these cities that he's talking about are he's treating as children of Jerusalem, is the idea. Okay? So, enlarge thy baldness as the eagle. See, they were instructed under Mosaic law not to trim their beards, Deuteronomy 14, but this was the ultimate form of shame, grief, or remorse, was to be shaven. When they want extreme thing, they would shave as, as a form of, re, of, 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 uh, of, of shame. It's, it's, a, it's an inverse of it, inversion of it, if you will. For they are gone into captivity from thee. They are to shave their heads in mourning, for they are to be taken away into captivity. They will be shaved anyway, because in, in it's part of the, the thing, into exile. And this is the climactic word that has been leading, we all been leading up to. All the way through this, the climactic word in this whole passage is exile, slavery, slavery. Now, do, they are headed for slavery. Part of Micah's message is to get across to those people that they're heading for slavery. What's interesting today, if you're listening to the informed experts, is our country is heading for slavery and indebtedness that can never be met. And uh, that, say, that, is, uh, that captivity of that debt. The borrower is slave to the lender. And here we have not only ourselves, but our children and our grandchildren, our great-grandchildren, are being shackled to a slavery that is in view if you, know how to, uh, if, you, if you have the perception to see it. And you wonder, is this the same judgment that God has in store for America? The thing that Micah is warning them of is what he also may be warning us of. And by the way, for the same reasons. It's our idolatry that is leading us into that slavery. As the eagle. Boy, that's an interesting phrase to anyone that is sensitive to history. You go back to Obadiah. and He's talking there about Edom. Because thou, thou exalt thyself as the eagle, and thou shalt set thy nest among the stars. Thence will I bring thee down saith the Lord. What's interesting of that idiom there, as we brought out in our study in, e uh, in Obadiah, Edom was just a small nation, but boasted of her achievements. The eagle has been the traditional si insignia of what? Israel's enemies. Not just Edom, that's the subject here, but it's the traditional insignia of Herod. It's a s s traditional, which was, e which was Edom. Herod, Edomans. It's a st it was the traditional symbol of Rome. It was the traditional symbol of the Nazis, of Nazi Germany. It was a traditional symbol of the British, which was an enemy of Israel. And Russia, the two-headed Israel uh, uh, eagle for the east and the west and of the Byzantine Empire and so forth. Interesting. The eagle as an ensign is interesting to study. It was always the symbol of Israel's enemies, the Greeks, the Spartan, the Trojans. Antiochus Epiphanes, symbol was the eagle. The Romans, Titus Vespasian, symbol, his legions, were the eagle. Herod, Byzantium, Russia, the Romanov eagle is a symbol of Russia even to this day. The Franks, the Germans, what was their symbol? The eagle. What was the symbol of the British? The eagle. Here's some examples of them. All different kinds through history. The eagle is always the symbol of Israel's enemies. How interesting it is to see after all this time America apparently joining these ranks. Micah's rhetorical tour de force is intended to dispel their complacency and arouse in them a sense of their own sin and their liability to judgment, punishment. That's us too. I think Micah's mission here is to dispel our complacency and arouse us in our sense of our sin and our liability to judgment. The northern kingdom was taken in captivity by the Assyrians and deported. It was God used their enemies as an instrument of judgment. And it's my suspicion that if there is a parallel, that God will use our enemies as, a, as an idiom of his judgment on America. Now, get touching about the northern kingdom, I want to dispel something else here, not take a lot of time on it. But the ten lost tribes that are littered all through literature is a myth that has emerged from careless scholarship. When you study Second Chronicles, 
11 and other similar passages, you'll discover that during that civil war, the faithful of all tribes migrated, those that were faithful to the south migrated to the south. It doesn't say this, but it's easy to assume that those in the south that wanted to be indulge in idolatry would go where it was politically correct and went north. They commingled. Don't confuse the geographic names with the ethnological names. The area of Ephraim is an area. The Ephraimites might be anywhere because they would have migrated. And that's spelled out in Second Chronicles 11. And the, the faithful of all 12, certainly the Levites specifically, went south to be faithful because they went where temple worship was the politically correct thing of the day and left where idolatry was being enforced. So the southern kingdom, a century after Micah's ministry, did ultimately go into exile, but for a definitive period of time. So the northern kingdom eliminated from history. Southern kingdom went into exile too, but because of one reason, and only one reason, God's commitment to David. They were there just for 70 years, a limited time, and they were promised restoration. They were, as God predicted, and to the very day, by the way, they were gathered in the days of Ezra and Nehemiah. They were dispersed throughout the world as a result of the rejection of the Messiah, the diaspora, from 70 AD and all. And that will be in view here as we go. But Isaiah tells us in Isaiah 11:11, 11, 11, when they're regathered the second time, oh, it begins the final consummation. And that's what we're witnessing in our lifetime, is that second regathering. So let's take a, why was Micah's ministry successful and the other minor prophets not? For three reasons. He identified himself personally with his people. He didn't ask them to do something that he refused to do himself. We picked it up in verse 8 and in verse 16 both. Secondly, he was specific. He dealt with them town by town by town. Thirdly, he was persistent. He didn't give up. He preached through three succeeding reigns. Jotham's, Ahaz, and Hezekiah. He hung in there. The first two of these reigned 16 years each. It appears that he may have preached for 20 years without any apparent signs of success. Finishing well is the name of the game. Galatians 6 9 says, Let us not be weary in well doing, for in due season we shall reap. If, oops, a big number, if we what? Faint not. Call to diligence. I love Churchill's summary of all of this. He says, Never give up. Never give up. Never give up. Never. Never give up. Famous speech, famous quote by Churchill who, who encouraged his nation through those dark days of the battle for Britain. Okay, in our next session, I want you to study Micah chapter 2. I want you to review the Palestinian covenant of the land and the conditions of obedience in Deuteronomy 28, 29, and 30. Just basic background. And I want you also to review the six woes of Isaiah 5. The chapter is five, but there are six woes in there I want you to be familiar with. And there are also other references to the same kind of thing that you can pick out of your notes, Deuteronomy 27, 1 Samuel 8, and Nehemiah 5, to get the flavor of what we're going to deal with in the next session. So with that, let's stand for a closing word of prayer.